Hello and welcome to the Open Education Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for today's session, Piloting Towards Success, a community approach to building a course redesign program. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm Publishing Director with the OEN. If you're not familiar with the OEN, we are a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OEN. I'm gonna go ahead and drop that URL into the chat. Before we begin, as many of you know, the Open Education Network is based at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. The campus is located on traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land, seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationship with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and people. Please feel free to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land you are situated on belongs in the chat if you feel so inclined. And with that acknowledgement, I'll now hand things over, and over to Brian McGeary from Pennsylvania State University. Brian is a member of the Summit Planning Committee who will introduce the session and monitor the chat. All right, thank you, Karen. Uh, as we begin the session, we'd like to share a few important details with you. The webinar is being recorded. For that reason, you're uh, currently muted. Uh, the video transcripts and slides will be posted on the OEN's 2021 YouTube Summit playlist after the summit has concluded. I'll drop a link to that here in the chat. Um, the last 15 minutes of today's session will be for questions. Uh, to submit a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We won't have time uh, to answer all the, all the questions, but uh, we will try our best. Uh, the chat will be a space to share additional comments or reactions. Uh, we're committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu slash summit community norms. Let me put that in the chat for you as well. The hashtag for the summit is hashtag OEN Summit 21. Join us on Twitter at, at OpenEd underscore network. And I'll put both of those in the chat for you as well. And now please join me in welcoming today's presenters. Uh, we have Amanda Herford, who is the Scholarly Communications Director for the Private Academic Library Network of Indiana, known as PALNI and Aaron Milanese, the Palney Affordable Learning Project Coordinator. All right, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Brian. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for having us and for joining this session today. We're super happy to talk to you today to talk about how we piloted our course redesign program at Palney and what we learned along the way. As mentioned, I'm Amanda Herford. I'm Scholarly Communications Director for Palney. And my co-presenter is Erin Milanese, who you'll hear from in just a little bit. All right, so I thought we would start off with a bit of a preview. Um, so to give you a bit of a preview of what we'll cover, we'll first talk a bit about our background, about our affordable learning program, PalSAVE, and we'll get into specifics about our course redesign grants program sharing how we ran a pilot in 2019 and 2020, and how we used what we learned to scale up for 2020, 2021. And finally, we'll share some of our takeaways from that experience and focus on some conclusions that we hope will be helpful to you as an audience. So before diving in too deep, again, Erin and I will share some background information about PalSAVE um, and also our schools, our needs, our funding, and our goals for our overall program. So what is PalSAVE? 
PalSAVE is Pounding Affordable Learning, and it's our consortium's collective initiative to do what we can as a group to address textbook affordability across private colleges in Indiana who are part of Pounding. And you can see one of our taglines here on the slide, and I'll just go ahead and read that. Um, PalSAVE supports affordable learning, student success and retention, and academic freedom by promoting open textbooks as an alternative to costly course materials. So basically, we work together in order to increase awareness and engagement with OER. So a little bit more about how we work together. PalSAVE is managed centrally for the consortium. As Palney staff, Erin and I are project leads for PalSAVE, and Palney's executive director, IR coordinator, and our communications and marketing director are also key project staff. So for example, Megan, our communication person, helped us get featured in some local news outlets, including the Indianapolis Business Journal and Indiana Public Radio, as seen here on the screen on the right. Um, then we also have our PalSAVE admin team, which is a team of librarians on Pownie school campuses. And this team sort of serves as our steering committee and advises us in, and in many cases actually works on the program components with us. So the work that we do is listed here on the screen, or at least the major components of it. We give faculty workshops and invite reviews as part of our membership in the Open Education Network. And in addition to our course redesign grants, we also recently started our textbook creation grants program. And lastly, we do a ton of data collection and analysis in order to show our impact, um, both to our grantor and to sort of the larger community who's interested in what we're doing. And that piece is a large part of what Erin does um, and works on regularly. So I'll hand it over to her now to talk more about our schools and our faculty. Yeah, it's important to explain a, a bit about our context and our needs as the schools we work with are different from state schools and community colleges. So Palney consists of 24 colleges and seminaries all across the state of Indiana. So you can see on the left, a map. Uh, each blue pin is a uh, Palney institution. All of our institutions are private and most, but not all have a religious affiliation. The student bodies at all the Pownie schools are very small. Our largest institution is Butler, which has about 6,000 students, but many of our schools have um, around 1,000, um, sometimes fewer. Um, and our seminaries are extra small with only about 100 students. Um, these are the sort of schools where when we tell you where we work, we're surprised if you've, if you've heard of them. Um, so small student bodies equals very small small budgets most of the time, both institutionally and also in the libraries, which are supporting our OER efforts. And the faculty expectations at Palney schools are a bit different too. And Palney faculty absolutely publish and do research, um, but our institutions tend to be more teaching focused instead of research focused. So um, getting tenure tends to be focused more on community involvement and institutional service and teaching, and our professors tend to have very teaching loads, so four or five courses each semester, sometimes even more. Right, so in our context, um, Pownie professors seem really eager for any professional development opportunities and are often surprised that there are incentives involved. Um, again, our institutions tend to have not a lot of budget to pay out these incentives. So being able to offer stipends for things like redesign grants and textbook reviews, I think has had a big impact on our participation. That said, faculty also just seem really eager for extra support and um, OER education. Our Pownie libraries um, and our Pownie librarians need access to programming and incentives as well. Um, as Amanda mentioned a couple of slides ago, we have a very centralized model in part because our libraries are so small. Most of them have only one to four librarians. Sometimes the entire staff of the library is only around four or five people. Um, so because of that, what they really need is just more hands on deck and we're able to, to help with that. Pownie students though are a lot like students at other institutions where they wanna save money and are impacted, impacted negatively by the cost of books. It is absolutely a myth that students at private institutions are wealthy and unconcerned about costs. 
Um, this is an average, but almost 30% of students at Pelham undergraduate institutions are Pell eligible. So because it's an average, some of our schools are actually closer to 50 or 60% Pell eligible, while others are lower. Um, and we have found in our surveys of students, if you want to go to the next slide, Amanda. Thanks. Um, we have found in some surveys of our students that the academic impacts of textbook costs are fairly similar to those at public institutions. So on this slide, the green numbers in the left-hand column are from the student textbook survey that we have run for three semesters at 12 county schools, um, about 2,500 students in total. The orange numbers in the second column are from the 2018 Florida textbook survey of students at public universities in Florida. So you could look at this data and say that our students are impacted maybe a bit less than the students at public universities, but we find this pretty sobering and feel like we have a lot of work to do yet to ensure that um, students at Pelney are not being negatively impacted by the cost of texts. Thanks, Erin. Okay, so moving on to our funding and our goals for our overall program. So the Lilly Endowment is a private philanthropic foundation in Indiana, and it focuses on areas of religion, education, and community development. And we found this funder to be sort of a perfect fit for our schools and the overall goals for our program. So we applied for a grant to fund our Palisade program for five years. And in 2019, we were actually awarded that grant in the amount of $520,000 to increase student access to affordable electronic textbooks, as the title of our official grant application says. Um, and our goals are to show positive impact in these areas listed on the screen. So we really wanted to build community across Pownee um, in open education, to produce content in creating textbooks, to support course transformations, which we'll talk more about in this presentation, also just to um, increase OER awareness, engagement, education and engagement, of course, to um, amass some student savings, to increase student success and retention, and to have significant participation across all of the schools in Pownee. So it's because of this funding that we were able to start the course redesign grants program that we're here to talk to you about today, and to provide faculty incentives to switch to zero cost materials. So first, I'll talk a little bit about the course redesign grants program as it exists today, and then we can back up and talk more about how we got here. So today, we're just now wrapping up our second year of the program. And in the course redesign grant program, Palney provides learning modules, we offer adoption support, and we pay a $500 stipend to faculty who redesign their courses with free textbooks. And they also are requested to provide some data about their courses so that we can track our impact again. We collect data for the course redesign grants um, on student perceptions of OER, student success and retention, and also we gather information that we need in order to calculate savings. So specifically, our goal for the course redesign grant program was to first meet the deliverable that we promised in our grant proposal, which was to transform at least 75 courses. In our grant proposal to Lilly, we said that we aimed to foster the transformation of at minimum 75 courses by supporting course redesign using affordable materials, adopting or adapting an open textbook or a newly created text. And we plan to do that by taking a tiered approach and providing different levels of incentives for faculty to either use library ebooks, adopt an open book, adapt or remix an open book, or even author a new textbook. But mostly the big idea behind our course redesign grants program was to think about how we can better support greater engagement with OER and give faculty that final push that they might need in order to actually adopt an open textbook. So we've been giving these faculty workshops for several years, both on campus and online, which became a really popular option due to COVID, um, which made in-person appearances impossible. Um, and the course redesign grant program really helped to answer the question of, well, what next? Um, what next after faculty attend a workshop, after they write a review, and after they complete that survey about their intent to adopt? 
So at the very beginning of all of this, we had assembled a group um, in concert with the Instructional Technology Advisory Group, which is another group that exists at Palmi, um, bringing folks together in order to achieve a common goal. So both, uh, both the PalSAVE team and the Instructional Technology Group had ideas and energy around this topic, and we really just needed a place to start. So we, together we formed the Resource Integration Task Force, and we laid out some specific tasks, which are listed on the screen here. And ultimately we were trying to get at the question, how can we as a consortium best support faculty in the course redesign process? And I've listed our um, members from that task force on the screen here. And again, we had several members from our PalSAVE team and then others from our instructional technology group. And it was a really good mix of talents um, that we brought together in order to build the content for our course redesign grant program. So the process that we undertook for our task force was to first find some great open resources that we could draw from for our um, program that we were going to offer out. So some helpful resources that we found were an OER sprint training from Open Oregon, the OER starter kit, ACC Learn OER, and understanding OER from Open SUNY. And what we did was we split up this content into sort of subcategories and we divided it up amongst our team and we worked independently on a brainstorming document, each of us working on a different section. And that document sort of evolved into what we're calling a learning guide for faculty, which was reviewed by the PalSAFE team um, and they provided feedback and we kind of revised it as we went. And what our outputs were from that task force were a final LibGuide to present that material. So we took the, the document that we had, were working on and put it in a LibGuide. And we also reported out about what, our, what we had done in our task force, just as sort of a final deliverable there. And then finally to hand it off to the PalSAVE team um, to figure out what the next steps might be. So here is that output that I mentioned, the LibGuide. Um, this is the zero cost textbook adoption LibGuide, which is openly available. Um, and I provided the URL there if you wanna look at it. And it's separated into several modules. They're setting the stage, which is just sort of background information, OER basics, locating OER, and then using non-open resources, evaluating resources, and then a little bit about course redesign and the process of integrating resources into your course. So now I'm gonna hand it back to Erin to talk about what we did next. Yeah, um, in this next section, I will be talking for quite a bit of time about the pilot. I'll talk about our participants, why we chose to do a pilot, how we gathered um, feedback and what kind of feedback we got, and then how we used that feedback to re revise the redesign grant program before its full launch. So the pilot ran in the summer of 2019 with faculty participating in the modules and redesigning their courses for the fall 2019 semester. So why did we choose to pilot? Um, a number of reasons that are on the screen right now. Uh, first, Palni is a very community and collaboration focused organization and doing a pilot allowed us to build on and create new connections within that community. So the PalSAVE admin team was already heavily involved. And then we had members of multiple other task forces like the resource integration task force. And then of course we had our faculty pilot participants. And these faculty pilot participants have remained involved in PalSAVE initiatives. Um, several have completed additional course redesigns. One applied for our creation grants and is now working with us on authoring a textbook. And all of them have just been really great advocates for OER and PalSAVE programming generally. Doing the pilot gave us practice with recruiting faculty and developing communications. Um, so again, we're 24 institutions, we're all set up slightly differently and doing the pilot helped us figure out the best ways to contact faculty. So on some campuses, we need to go through directors. On other campuses, we uh, have a PalSAFE contact that we work with. In some places, it's fine if we contact faculty directly. So um, doing the pilot helped us figure out uh, how each of our institutions prefer us to communicate with people. We were able to catch issues and improve processes with the application process, troubleshoot problems, and you know it's much easier to do that when you have a group of seven versus 
a much larger group. And we'll talk more later about the full scale launch, but I'll just say we had way more applications for our first semester than we ever expected. So having these processes uh, fine tuned in advance was, was really good. Um, we got a lot of input on the LibGuide modules um, that Amanda just referenced. We were able to tweak them, remove one, add supplemental, supplemental content based on what our pilot participants thought was most valuable. It gave us some reassurance. Um, the PalSave admin team is primarily a group of librarians and PalSave and Palni are seen as library things. So we had some concern about including concepts like backwards design and open pedagogy in our modules for faculty. Like would people think we were overstepping or that we didn't have enough expertise in those areas? Uh, but turns out, no, uh, the faculty were really receptive to those being a part of the program. Um, so it gave us some reassurance in including those. And this last bullet point, for me, the person who handles a lot of the tracking of progress, um, it gave me a chance to figure out the best ways to track that progress. How often do I need to be emailing faculty? Like, where's what's the balance between um, reminders and, and nagging, I guess? So it was good practice for figuring out how we were going to um, contact faculty and how often. Great. Next slide, Amanda. Thanks. <laughs> um, our faculty participants are listed on the screen here. We had seven from four institutions and from six disciplines. Um, so there were two from chemistry, but also represented were psychology, engineering, computer science, education, and criminal justice. They were recruited from uh, a group of faculty that had submitted textbook reviews following a workshop and they did have to go through a full like application and acceptance process to be a pilot participant. They were paid a $1,000 stipend in exchange for their participation and that participation included, you know, we did expect them to be full participants in the course redesign program so they needed to complete the modules give us a syllabus for their course and uh, provide us with various data. Um, and of course, switch to a zero cost textbook. But then as a pilot participant, we also expected them to fill out an evaluation form on each of the six course modules on the LibGuide. And we asked them to attend a feedback session in Zoom to share their thoughts with the PalSave team. So a bit about the feedback that we were getting. Um, most of it was most of the feedback we were requesting was about those LibGuide modules developed by the Resource Integration Task Force. And we were curious both about the process and the content. So in terms of process, how easy were these to navigate? Did you have any trouble finding the link? How did it work on mobile? Did you run into any tech issues? Um, but then for the content, you know, what did you find most valuable? What did you learn in this module? What should be revised? And to gather this feedback, again, we had a Google form on each embedded into each of the six LibGuide modules, and they completed the form. Um, it had a mixture of question types. So there were some that were a rating scale from one to five. So we got some um, quantitative information from them there. And then a lot of open-ended questions. And the feedback session on Zoom was a chance to answer questions and share general feedback about the program as a whole. So, in the end, we ended up with a, a lot of data um, and it was a good mix of quantitative and qualitative. So how this looked, um, <laughs> these next few slides are examples of what the data looked like and kind of how we organized it. So I was tasked with doing some initial organization of the feedback and again, there was just so much. So I started by creating some Google Sheets that were sorted by participant and also by module. So this on the screen now is just a screenshot of how um, some of this compiled data looked. So pink was module five. I color coded the comments. So like the yellow highlight there was to represent a suggestion for change. Um, things that were in red were things that definitely needed change like a broken link. Um, and then another color was used for positive comments. Uh, some additional examples of the types of qualitative information we got from faculty, both of these were on module four, which covered evaluating resources, so just two pieces of feedback we got. I did appreciate the insights on the need for materials that are accessible to students with disabilities. 
Uh, whereas another participant said, this module had a good checklist. However, I found a lot of the information redundant and common sense. I actually think this module can be boiled down to mostly the checklist given in the evaluation tools box. The authority box is something that I don't believe is on that checklist and is super important to consider. Um, and spoiler alert, based on this feedback, we did end up heavily overhauling module four because um, several people commented that the information was perhaps redundant. The next thing we did um, to really focus on what needed to be changed in each of the modules, each member of the PalSave team sort of chose a module and looked at the feedback for that module and sorted it into definitely change, consider changing, and other comments. So on the screen now is module one, setting the stage, and then the list of things that based on the feedback we felt should be definitely changed or considered changed. And then the last bit of feedback was our Zoom session. So this is just a screen grab from one of our Zoom feedback sessions. We held two of these in, and split the faculty up so that there were four at one and three at the other, along with uh, any PalSave team member who could attend. These were really valuable for getting sort of big picture feedback on the pilot program. Um, these feedback sessions were semi-structured and we started with everyone introducing themselves and then had a handful of questions for the pilot participants. Um, things like, what did you find most valuable? What modules would you recommend revising? And then there was time at the end for sort of open conversation. All right, so how did we use all this feedback? <laughs> Well, the first thing we did was start another task force. <laughs> so this task force was called the Adoption Task Force, and its charge was to draw on the pilot program and make changes to the modules and um, the redesign grant program. And this task force ran from the fall of 2019 until the spring of 2020 when we like launched full scale. And the task force consisted of me and two of my colleagues, Caitlin at Marion and Olivia at Butler. And Amanda was at most of our meetings as well to give additional input. And basically, we started with this huge pile of data. We actually met in person and had a ton of post-it notes and had a very elaborate Trello board where we could sort things by module and priority, prioritizing. Um, prioritizing was, was the trickiest part of all of this. So deciding what, need, what changes absolutely needed to be made was again, pretty difficult, but we made a lot of them. And perhaps the biggest was the decision to switch platforms. So we moved our course modules from LibGuides to Canvas. And there was a lot of discussion about this. And um, as Amanda shared the link earlier, these are still available, but we now just use them as sort of uh, outward facing versus our um, educational modules for our redesign grant participants. But there was this sort of philosophical discussion. You know, our program is centered on the importance of open materials and content, and we really wanted our materials to be available publicly. But one of the most consistent pieces of feedback from our pilot participants was that the LibGuide was confusing to navigate. So for example, um, do you start with the center column because it's the biggest, or do you read it from left to right? Do you read it, you know, the full left column first, or do you read it sort of across? And we also heard that on mobile, it was sort of condensing everything into one column, which was making it tricky for people to know how to navigate it. So after a lot of discussion, we decided to switch to an LMS. As for which LMS, Palni is split very, fairly evenly between Canvas and Moodle, and we opted for Canvas, mostly because Olivia, who was a member of the task force, um, she was willing to work with the Butler academic tech team to get us set up. And this ended up being a really beneficial switch in other ways too, as we were able to add in some collaborative elements that weren't possible before. We added um, discussion boards into the final version. And we also switched from Google form evaluations to just short Canvas quizzes, um, which are like two question knowledge checks and a way to track participation. Of course, the downside of this is that we hadn't piloted with Canvas, and so we had to do a lot of additional testing uh, with how to enroll people, how to make sure the instructions were clear. The other big change was in the program um, as a whole. As Amanda had mentioned um, a few slides ago, in our initial vision, we thought there would be this tiered approach where you could apply for additional funds if you wanted to edit or adapt, and we weren't quite sure where people using zero-cost resources would fit in. 
after talking with our pilot participants and going through the pilot, we decided to just kind of have it all be under the same umbrella. Um, so as we rebuilt the modules in Canvas, we switched our language to zero cost from open resources and um, decided that people who wanted to use library resources could also just apply for the same program. Uh, yeah, and we decided not to do a separate redesign grant program for adapting and editing and instead to offer those people just different kinds of support. So we give them access to press books if they want, or we'll connect them to people at their institutions. Uh, the other changes included combining two modules. Uh, we, we combined selecting OER and evaluating OER into one. And then because of the change to the program overall, we added a new module more focused on zero cost resources that aren't OER. And we added a bit more on open pedagogy and backwards design. So those are just some of the changes we made based on the feedback that we received. Thanks, Erin. Okay, so after we integrated all of that feedback um, into the learning modules and got some practice tracking participation and communicating with faculty, we were ready to start year two, which was the you know year one uh, post pilot, um, which was the full scale launch of the program. Um, so we announced the full program at the beginning of 2020, um, and we sent invites directly to faculty who had attended our workshops. We had been maintaining a, a listserv of those faculty. Uh, we also let our Poundly community members, such as instructional designers and librarians, we let them know about the opportunity as well so that they could pass it on to their faculty at their local level. Um, and this included sending messages to our library directors via their listserv, um, contacting our designated PalSave contacts at each institution, and also making a post on our Poundly community forum. And we did choose to go ahead and keep the LibGuide as an open resource, as Erin mentioned. So we updated the LibGuide and made it openly available um, or continue to make it openly available. But we also additionally enrolled faculty participants in the closed Canvas course, which had nearly identical content, um, but was reformatted per that feedback that the LibGuide was um, super confusing. Um, and another advantage of the Canvas course was it allowed us to better track faculty participation and provided those discussion opportunities for the faculty as well. So in practice, a bit about how the first year actually went. Um, and to kind of acknowledge the elephant in the room, um, COVID really did affect all of us in ways that I don't even think we understand at this point and we can't really measure. So we're not sure if we had increased or decreased participation because of COVID but it was there all year and it impacted our work and our sense of well-being, both mental and physical. Um, so, you know, we pushed back deadlines and we provided deferral options for all participants in light of everything that was going on there. Um, we also noticed an increased tracking load, of course, um, going from uh, only seven participants to scaling up significantly, we had a big increase in the time and attention needed in order to track all the course redesign grants. So scaling up here meant more spreadsheets to maintain, more emails to send and sort of email templates to develop, um, syllabi to review and manage and payments to process. So that was a lot of work and huge thanks to Erin for her meticulous efforts there. Um, we were also surprised by the autonomy of our faculty participants. We had very few general support requests and we had very few actually say that they wanted or needed help with adaptation and remixing. Um, so, and the few who had responded when we asked if they needed, if faculty needed help with those things, um, primarily had questions about how to post chapters to the LMS or to rearrange chapters. And they were all largely satisfied with just sort of a stock response that we had formulated, offering tips and resources for those things. Um, we also decided to start the Open Educator Awards to recognize our, our pioneers, our champions, and our innovators who went the extra mile with their open education practice. So for the first year, we decided to go ahead and recognize all of our piloting faculty for being um, again, pioneers, champions, being the first to redesign their courses and providing feedback to us and helping to shape the program and just sort of being our test case and being so gracious and helping us build this program. 
So some results to share with you after 2020, 2021. Um, these are the cumulative results now that we've re reached the end of this academic year. So this includes this year and the pilot year. So we have more than 20 participating institutions, which is the vast majority of all Pownley in institutions who participated in this redesign program. We supported over 90 course transformations, which um, good news, exceeded our goal of 75 courses in the first year. We have already received more than um, 70 applications and faculty who are enrolled in the program for the next academic year, um, which we actually decided to switch from being closed at a certain date to just being open on a rolling basis until we run out of funds um, to provide those stipends. And probably the stat that I'm most excited about or proud about on this screen is that 100% of faculty who participated in both the pilot and the, um, the first full year um, would recommend this program to a colleague. So that, that feels good that we're doing something right. Um, some additional results here on the right. Um, these are results from our course tracker. So this includes courses that were transformed via the course redesign grants and any sort of incidental Palni folks who had um, learned about PalSave and decided to fill out our tracker to be logged as part of our, our progress, our impact. Um, so that showed that we have impacted over 6,000 students so far, and we've saved over $360,000 since starting this program in 2019. So a little bit more um, results and feedback to share. Here are just a few quotes from our piloting faculty members about their overall experience in the course redesign program. And these came from the open-ended comment area on our course tracker that I just mentioned. Um, so I'll go ahead and read these. So participating in the PalSave course redesign grant gave me the necessary tools and support to fully transition from an expensive commercial textbook to an OER. That was a professor from Franklin College. And then a professor from Oakland City University said that the opportunity to work with the PalSave team has been rewarding for him and his students and that his students are benefiting through the use of quality criminal justice re research for instructional purposes without battling the high costs of traditional texts. So again, it's just really rewarding to see all of our efforts come together for something that really did help these faculty on their journeys. Um, and last but not least, I wanted to kind of put a little bit of a plug um, to stay tuned for some of our interesting data coming out about student perception and success with OER. Um, particularly in the private setting. Um, we're excited to share with that with you that as soon as we can, as soon as we've had a chance to really um, analyze it and to put it into a format that's shareable. But here are just a few quotes that we pulled from the student perception survey about what students liked about free textbooks. So they liked that they were able to save money so that they could actually take a course. They liked that it saved them money and stress. They liked that they could make annotations, highlights, and other comments. Um, they liked the convenient transportation um, and the fact that it was a good quality resource and easy to navigate. Um, so those are some of the really positive comments that we got. We had very few negative comments. Um, so it's also been inspiring just to kind of learn about the student experience um, with OER. So I'm gonna pass it back to Erin. So we'd like to end today by talking about takeaways, both for us and um, hopefully our audience. So what did, what did we learn and take away from the redesign grant pilot? For me, um, it's not on the slide and this feels like a bit of a confession, but a big takeaway for me is just the importance of doing pilots. This is not really my preferred style of doing things. I'm more of a like jump in and see what happens sort of person, especially when I'm excited about something, which I'm pretty much always excited about OER related things. So it's really good that there are people like Amanda at Palney who help me, you know, <laughs> recognize the importance of slowing down and doing pilots. Um, and I, I am, I'm very glad that we did pilot this program um, because we had 97 applicants that first that first semester. And of course, you know, this was in the midst of COVID when we had lots of other things going on. So it was just really glad. It was really good that we had um, our processes figured out and um, just really perfected in, in the best way we could. And again, with 24 institutions, it just really is important to um, 
to understand the structures and policies and politics at each institution. And so doing the pilot helped us figure out the best way to communicate with these institutions. Uh, but again, as COVID reminds us, even no matter how much piloting and planning you do, you can still encounter um, major unexpected things. <laughs> so I, I think the last day our applications were due was actually the day most of our schools announced they were closing and switching to remote learning. So uh, we had to extend our application window and it was just a, a reminder that, yeah, stuff happens no matter how much you plan. Um, and my big takeaways, again, we're glad that we piloted, um, but mine was just had a lot to do with the faculty themselves. Um, I found it nice to sort of have this dry run with such understanding participants. These faculty who started out with us knew that we were new at this. We weren't trying to hide that in any way. And they were there to provide constructive feedback like that was their role. So I feel like as part of this process, um, we had a really great opportunity to get to know a few of the pounding faculty better and myself not being at one of the campuses. Um, it was really nice to have that opportunity just to, to talk to them and get to know them a little bit and learn about their interest and their journey with OER. Um, and also having a smaller cohort really helped to establish those good relationships and think about who is our core group of OER champions. Um, it also really helped to alleviate the imposter syndrome that some of us were feeling, having never done anything like this before. And Erin touched on this a little bit, um, you know, with that word reassurance. Um, we felt really weird talking about things like open pedagogy and backwards design since none of us had done any of those things before. They're definitely not in our wheelhouse as librarians. Um, but the faculty really liked those materials and those resources and their comments on that really gave us the confidence that we needed um, to know that we were on the right path and that we should be exploring these resources and talking about them and providing um, you know, links to amazing resources that are out there on the web, whether or not we've actually participated in anything like this ourselves. Um, it was really good just to have that opportunity to adjust the content and the platform and the honest feedback from the, the faculty participants was really what we needed there and super valuable. Um, and lastly, when you don't pilot, you really wish that you would have. Um, there have been other areas of our program and in my other work where we kind of just jumped in with both feet because we were either like pressed for time or we just didn't like take a minute. Um, and when that happens, I always kind of find that I kick myself. Um, I feel like snags are inevitable in any kind of program and it's much easier to handle with a small group. Um, so whenever possible, I suggest that you plan to pilot. Um, so another kind of outcome of this is that, you know, we, we do have more pilot projects. We've learned that pilot, piloting can be very effective. So we've used it in other areas of our program too. So we're currently working on six textbook creation grants, but one of those, um, our pilot project is about 10 months ahead of the rest of the, 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 the projects. So that that can be our test case. Um, and this author has been really gracious and helped us revise our application to establish a reasonable timeline, um, got acclimated to press books and will be the first book to be peer reviewed and copy edited and help us to define those processes as we go forward. Oh, and I just wanted to let you know the resources for our textbook creation grants are on our website if you're interested. Sorry. <laughs> um, the textbook survey I mentioned way back, you know, uh, a million slides ago, um, was also also started out as a pilot. Uh, three schools ab agreed to be our pilot participants. Again, as much as I wanted to just jump right in, uh, the pilot proved really useful in particular for figuring out IRB. So we were able to secure IRB at one pilot school and then since then have used that IRB application to request reciprocal IRB at the other schools. Um, and so figuring out that process has been really helpful for um, distributing the survey more widely. And I also learned a lot about what kinds of data and data visualization is most important to the institutions based on some of that early feedback I got um, after sending out initial reports, which saved me a lot of time in the subsequent report making. Okay, and this is our, our last slide here. Um, we wanted to try to draw out some, some takeaways that we hoped would be particularly helpful for you. Um, so it may be terribly obvious at this point, but we just wanted to share that piloting helps. Um, starting small and scaling up is a good approach that we found and pretty much piloting everything is a really good idea, especially when you're working at a large scale. 
Yeah. And no matter how well you plan, you can't predict or plan for everything like a pandemic. Um, also, faculty make really good partners and they like being part of the process. We made some really good connections um, with some lovely people and we really did enjoy working with them, even though we thought it might be a little bit scary. It wasn't. It was great. Uh, we learned that focusing on your audience needs or your learner needs is really important. We didn't necessarily want to move our modules into Canvas, but in the end decided that it was worth that change and that work to make that change to ensure a good learning experience for our participants. And last is the importance of delegation and team involvement. Lots of people and task forces and faculty members um, and just sort of pound me at large were involved in our community approach to, to the course redesign. Um, and the program was really better for it. So we couldn't have done it alone and we shouldn't do it alone. Um, so I invite you to take that as your um, main takeaway from this as well. So with that, uh, we can open it up to questions. I've seen a few people asking for the link to the LibGuide. So I will stick that into chat right now. There was also a uh, question about whether or not you have or will share the uh, Canvas course to Canvas Commons so that others um, who use that LMS can access it. That is a good question. I think we would be open to it. Um, currently, it's hosted, as Aaron mentioned, at one of our member institutions. So I'm not exactly sure what the process is on that. Um, I don't know if that was discussed in the more beyond that, Aaron. No, but I can I can ask. <laughs> it's a good question. Okay, there was also another question. Um, if you could provide a specific example or two of some of the most impressive projects that came out of the program. Um, what I can do is share a link with you to our course redesign grants page. Um, so essentially what we've been gathering is syllabi from the faculty participants to show us that they did use a, a, you know, a commercial textbook and now they're using something that's open or zero cost. Um, so for the most part, we just know that they've redesigned their course and that they're now using a, a zero cost textbook and there hasn't been a whole lot of follow up um, to find out that they're doing awesome things. Um, other than, you know, sort of what's been reported to us from the ground level. So I mentioned those um, Open Educator Awards that we had rewarded last year. We're just about ready to announce our next um, award cycle, um, if you will. And we're really focusing on um, champions and um, a few um, course redesign participants who had created their own textbooks. Um, so what I'll do is I will share the URL to the course design page, which lists all the projects. Um, I don't know if you have anything more specific to share, Erin. Yeah, um, I, I handle a lot of the data, um, and that, which includes the course tracker. So um, there was one example of last fall when one of our redesign grant participants filled out the tracker, which includes, you know, what textbook are you using now and what textbook were you using previously? And by clicking the link to the textbook he was using now, I realized he had actually authored that textbook, which Amanda and I were unaware that he had done that. Um, and so um, that doesn't happen often, but that was a really, uh, a really cool thing. Um, yeah. Hey, there was a, another question. Um, what was the research process like to identify the Lilly Grant? And are you continuing to scale up how many projects you take on, or are you planning on keeping the awards around the same amount? I can answer the first part about the Lilly Grant. So um, Pauli and Lilly have had a relationship for quite a while. Um, I believe that the um, establishment of Pauli as a consortium was funded in part by the Lilly Endowment itself. So you know we've been aware of each other for a while. Um, and known that um, that funding exists there for the right project. So we didn't have to do a ton of research in order to you know, find that funder um, and be aware of that opportunity. But we did just sort of poke around on their website um, in order to get an idea of you know, what are the, the areas that they particularly like to focus on um, and just kind of get an idea of what other projects were, um, were funded. 
What was the second part of that question, Brian? Yeah, the uh, second part of it was, um, are you continuing to scale up uh, how many projects you take on or are you planning to keep the awards around the same amount? So that's a really interesting question. Um, so we had a set amount that we had dedicated to providing stipends in our grant. Um, and we had thought about having, um, you know, some of those for redesign grants, some of them to create materials, and then also some of them to provide stipends for writing reviews. And we've surprisingly gone through that fund very quickly because we decided um, probably around the time that we you know, released the course redesign grant um, full launch year, that there's really no reason to hold on to some of the funds to um, you know, apply them later in the program. We might as well get as many participants in as early as possible. That way we can benefit from them redesigning their course and um, continue that savings and student success throughout the life of our grant. Um, so we have spent the majority of our funds already and we probably have enough to uh, support about, uh, I think, 100 course redesign grants for the coming um, academic year. Um, so this will likely be the last year that we're able to offer those grants under this um, this grant, but um, we're we're trying to think about sustainability of our program and communicating with with Lily on letting them know the success that we've had and the fact that we want to continue on. Um, so we're hoping that we can continue to scale up um, and make this an ongoing um, program. Okay. Um, there was another question. Um, have you considered course alignment maps to show more details of how they use the zero cost or OER materials? I'm not sure. Do you want to, were you going to say something, Aaron? I can just say we've collected the syllabi. So we have this huge collection of syllabi. And honestly, we haven't figured out quite how we're going to use those, but that might be the first step in doing something like that. Um, and we also, again, have had a lot of requests and interest from faculty about more with open pedagogy. So I think as we sort of branch into that, something like looking at course alignment and how they're being used um, would be good to do. Because yeah, right now we've just really focused on, you know, making sure faculty are aware these textbooks exist and are adopting them and beyond like checking the syllabus to make sure that they're actually using an open textbook. Um, we haven't done haven't done a whole lot more in terms of how they're using them. But that would be, yeah, it's a good next step. One thing that we are working on right now is building out sort of a repository that shows the books that were selected for each course redesign um, project um, and hoping that we can build upon the books that were selected um, to potentially add open syllabi or ancillaries or things like that to the collection in the repository. So that's um, kind of under construction right now, but that's kind of what we're hoping um, is going to be um, a, a way for folks to um, see what faculty in a particular discipline or teaching a particular course have selected as their OER to kind of serve that purpose. Okay, there's another question. Um, so you, you mentioned the textbook uh, creation pilot underway. Can you say more about how it's going so far? Sure. So the textbook creation pilot that we have going right now is called the Bible in Music. Um, and it's with a professor at Butler University. And it's going really well. Um, as I mentioned, he's several months ahead of the other um, projects. Um, so he's been sort of our pioneering faculty member who's really wanted to dive into Pressbooks more than we had envisioned. Um, we kind of thought that we would have a, you know, a, a Word doc or a Google doc manuscript um, that was going to be something that, you know, could be easily copy edited um, and, um, e you know, easy to share in that way. Um, but he was super excited about using Pressbooks. So it's been interesting knowing that um, you know, this faculty member wants to participate to that degree um, and just kind of going with it and like giving him access to Pressbooks and letting him begin to build in that environment. And you know, if we need to export it out in order to provide it to a copy editor, 
I mean, you know, so be it. Um, you know, we we've learned to be flexible with these with these programs or with these projects. Um, so I believe he's already using it in his course, um, and we'll be able to incorporate some student feedback on his next draft. Um, so the first official draft is due in October of this year. Um, so our next stage, our next stage is going to be researching peer reviewers. Um, so we're kind of excited to see how that's all going to go and to identify anything that we might want to change for the, the rest um, of, the, of the projects. Did you have anything to add to that, Erin? Um, another, another interesting pro project um, to mention is um, another Butler University professor who participated in the course redesign grants also wrote his own textbook in Pressbooks. Um, and this was before we were ready to get started on the, the textbook creation grants. Um, so he had reached out to someone on our team and said, you know, I really want to create this book. Can you help me? And we're like, well, we have Pressbooks, but we don't really know how to use it yet. <laughs> um, but he just dove in and created his book and didn't need an ounce of um, uh, you know, guidance or anything like that. So again, we're just floored by the autonomy of these faculty members who are just so excited about open education that they just wanna go for it. Um, and that one is Brass Techniques and Pedagogy. I can find a link to that too. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, all these textbook creation um, projects have kind of taken a life of their own. Um, and we've just been really amazed at the faculty who just kind of do this stuff without any incentives or guidance or anything like that. Okay, those are all the questions that are in the queue currently. Uh, if anybody has any final questions, go ahead and get them in the Q&A. Okay, we've got another question here. Um, what is the age of the faculty who uses WordPress? I have no idea. You mean press books? Probably, yeah. Okay, yeah, I haven't actually met him. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. I think they, I, I guess we could Google him, but I think he might be younger. And that's one interesting thing about being at the consortial level is a lot of these people who we work with um, and email with regularly, like we've never actually seen in person or have any idea what they look like or anything like that, or, you know, their age bracket. But I was really excited to see that that book recently um, has a review um, from a professor at Central College and it looks pretty good. So it's really exciting. Okay, um, any final questions? Okay, well, looks like there aren't any uh, additional questions. So thank you very much, uh, Amanda and Aaron. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. Um, and thank you audience for joining us. We wanna remind you that today's webinar has been recorded and will be shared in the coming weeks. Um, you can subscribe to our YouTube playlist to receive a notification. And I'll give you again, the link to that playlist in the chat. Um, Slides and transcripts will also be linked there, um, and we encourage you to keep the conversation going by joining us on Slack. I uh, put the link to that in the chat as well. And also, if you're an OEN member, we hope you'll continue the conversation in the OEN Google group. So thank you all again uh, for joining our session today.